Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the last session of the day. Um, my name is Audrey Jamal. I'm with the University of Guelph, and it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Zita Cobb. Zita is uh, an eighth-generation Fogo Islander, co-founder and CEO of Shorefast, and an innkeeper at the Fogo Island Inn. A registered Canadian charity, Shorefast uses business-minded means to help secure economic and cultural resilience for Fogo Island, Newfoundland, a centuries-old settler fishing community off Newfoundland's northeast coast. Zita has been a member of the Order of Canada since 2016 and was a 2020 inductee into Canada's Business Hall of Fame. She also holds, holds several honorary doctorates from Canadian universities. And it is my pleasure to start a conversation with you um, focused on a community-based approach to food. So, Audrey, welcome. nice to be hanging out with you again. Good to be here with yes. you too. I think we're going to have some fun. So it's great to be here with everybody. We have 29 minutes and five seconds. <laughs> We do have a <laughs> no pressure. Zita, when, um, when people think of you or they hear of Fogo Island, um, we're going to try something with images and words. So they often think of, of the inn. Tell us what you'd like us to know about the inn. It's like a cherry on a very old cake. <laughs> and, and we, not so jokingly, say it's a Trojan horse. Like, it's an irresistible thing when it gets inside your head. You can't not see it. That was intentional. But what it really is, is the physical manifestation of a place. Because I think it's a great inn. Anybody here been to the inn? At least some of you have. Yes, lots of people have. I think it's a perfect reflection of the culture of the place. It's made of the place. And its job is to mediate the relationship between this far away from far away place and the globalized world. And where everything about the way we made this in was organized around a poem. Mm. And a poem is the art of walking upright is the art of using both feet. One is for holding on to the place and one is for reaching out. And so we've got to build a world that has communities in it. And communities need to be able and enabled to trade in their own assets. So this in is about all of that. It just looks like an inn. Mm -hmm. So that's why we call it a Trojan horse, mm. for this, these ideas of place. Um, so before there was an inn, there was a tractor. Oh yeah, but that, that's not actually our tractor. I, have, I couldn't, couldn't find a picture of our tractor at the last minute. So we didn't start with an inn, we started with a tractor. Because I grew up on this island and I left to go to university in 1975. Which is not, not 1875, 1975. <laughs> When I left uh, that year, I would say we were producing 70% of what we ate. Every single family grew something, everything. We had chickens and goats and, well, of course, we're fishing people, so everything that swims in the North Atlantic doesn't stand a chance against uh, Newfoundland fishers. And we, we hunted. And I moved back home in 2006. And all of those gardens, and these are small family garden plots. Every one of them, maybe not every one, maybe there were a few left, had all grown over. Because when I left home, the ferry didn't run every day. And when the ferry started running every day, it's like, well, why would we bother growing potatoes? We can get potatoes from Prince Edward Island. Oh, even better, we can get them in French fry shape, and then we don't have to even cut them up. And so we abandoned the gardens. And we, more than anybody else in our country, as Newfoundland, and I see Josh Me is here, and Josh, you would say this, we have the worst health indicators in our country. We fell into the big pit of industrial food head first and we were happy about it. We never met a cheesy we didn't love. <laughs> and so we started, the, we got the tractor so that we were gonna, we knew that an inn was coming and we, we can use this inn. That, I mean, the inn is like an electric eel in the pond. And its job is to activate the assets of the place. But if all the gardens were grown over, Nobody was going to grow anything. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible. So that little tractor went around and broke gardens. We even broke gardens for people that didn't even belong to them. We found that out the hard way. But anyway, <laughs> so you can't break the garden. That's not your garden. Tell us about this garden. There's a greenhouse there as well. This is Freeman Compton's garden, and that's in Bard Islands. Newfoundland, you know, it's called the rock. Labrador is even more rocks. And, but the soil we have is actually rich. And people say, people actually, someone asked me the other day, is, is the moose that you serve at the inn organic? 
It's like, I don't know, I suppose we're going to have to ask the moose about that. Like, what was the moose eating? But anyway, the soil is naturally organic because we've never had any of the things that you would worry about. Um, and this is Freeman. And the, 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 those people in Bard Islands grow in this space. And um, the little greenhouse that you see in the background makes all the difference to everything. And what, we have a business assistance fund. The, uh, what, the first loan we gave was to him. He borrowed the money in the spring and he paid it back in the fall. It's amazing. Now, we traditionally have only grown root vegetables, but if you say to someone on Fogo Island, what about, I don't know, kohlrabi or fennel? Well, then we get so much fennel we don't know what to do with. And so, but now you can grow anything. One guy grew a melon. Yeah. One, One melon, one. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's technically oh, it possible, good. yes. So, so food has also been central to relations and relationship building. Farmers, chefs. I mean, food is the essential stickiness of all of our relationships. It, like, no matter where you live, it's about, I mean, ritual is what helps us make meaning. We make, we create rituals around food. So that's Elf Coffin, and that's Tim Charles, who is the chef, executive chef at the Inn. And, yeah, I mean, the two of them, I think they're having zucchinis there. Yes, that's zucchini, I'm quite sure. Um, yeah, when you are working together around food and food systems, you don't actually have to agree on anything else. Like, I think one of the fallacies of the world we're living in is we think we all have to agree on everything. And, you know, especially in the last six months, we're realizing this is not going so well. People in the world don't agree on stuff. We don't have to, but we have to get along. And food is like the unifying thing that'll always be there. We'll, I think we'll always agree on that. So there's a beautiful dining room at the inn. Um, and the food that's grown often makes its way into the dining room. Tell us a little bit about how food is connected to place. Well, our, we see our work at the inn as being that electric eel, activating food systems, getting people to think differently about food. And so most people wouldn't think about Newfoundland and Labrador as being a hotbed of great food. But it's unfair. Now, we have a long history of um, trying to make a living on the North Atlantic. So we're, you know, we're, we don't have time for fancy stuff, generally. This is very fancy. And so we wanted to pick up the threads of the traditional food ways and present them in more contemporary ways that maybe have, I mean, I never met a salt shaker I didn't fall in love with. That's an important part of our history, which is why we have all the heart disease. So the inn tries to kind of gently lead in new ways. But so I'll tell you two things about the inn. Our goal, and I think we achieve it, is 80% of what we put in front of you to eat or drink has to be from here. And when we started, I'll give you an example of something, we were serving orange juice. And because, you know, people come to fancy inns, they expect freshly squeezed orange juice. And the inn belongs to the community members, and so when we opened, all of the households came to stay. Oh, we're into the next slide. Very clever. And uh, anyway, one of the women who that had stayed said, she said, it's all very lovely. It was wonderful. And she had a whole bunch of feedback. And she said, but the worst thing is, she said, I don't understand why you're serving orange juice up there. She said, we have all these edible berries, and any one of them will be happy to be a juice if you people just ask them. <laughs> so now we don't serve orange juice. Now, sometimes we get guests that are quite cranky about the fact that we don't serve orange juice, but I mean, it, it really comes down to that. Like all of these things, that changes we have to make, somebody needs to give up something. And if you're on the Northeast Coast of Newfoundland, you, I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to give up orange juice. We did offer to give a guy some of the industrial orange juice once, and he decided he'd go with the local juice. <laughs> um, cod is, is important, we know for so many reasons. Tell us how the cod is coming back both to the table and then we'll also talk a little bit about Fogo Island fish after that. Yeah, we have to talk about place to talk about cod. So as a place, so I used to work for a, in, in technology for a company called JDS Uniface and the CEO was a fellow named Joseph Strauss. And he was a physicist. He would come in every morning. We were a technology company. He would say, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing, the most important thing. And of course, in a technology company, it's, it's technology, because if you get, if someone gets past you, you're, it's a winner takes all game, you're gonna be dead. 
But in this work, and in the work that I think collectively the people here are, work, are focused on, the most important thing is place. Place, 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 and after that, place. Because place holds nature, place holds culture, Every single thing that we all worry about, we got people you know, working on homelessness and working on mental health and working on better food, so it all lands in a place. So what I try to say to people, if you're thinking about how do you do this work, no matter where you are, at least once a week, go out and lie on the ground and just try and understand this place from the ground. And we have to build, the previous speakers were talking about systems, we absolutely need to be very mindful of the systems we're caught up in, and it's hard to change systems, but we have to work from the ground up and the top down. And that's why these kinds of gatherings to look at, like as a country, we don't have the horizontal musculature to run our country. It's like a whole bunch of disorganized loose ends. Everybody gets up in the morning and tries to do their best. Well, not everybody, most people do. Um, and it doesn't add up to enough. Like the sum of what we do is not even the sum of the parts, let alone more than the sum of the parts. So I think as a country, we have to build that collaborative, cooperative architecture. And, you know, it's a cod. This is the most noble cod, the no most noble fish on the planet. It has more protein than any other fish. And it was fished almost to extinction by a system that forgot about place. Our culture is derived from that fish. And we started a little business because the cod are slowly, ever so painfully slowly coming back. When the cod stocks collapse, which is in my lifetime, the cod was being sold for cat food because it was caught in these industrial systems that didn't respect it. And so it sort of got a bad name. We on Fogo Island are the luckiest people in the world, in a way, but we have this gift of place. But we also, in the late 60s, when we were threatened with resettlement, started a cooperative, a fisheries cooperative. So the most important industry on Fogo Island is the fishery. And it still is the most important industry. And anything we do in tourism, is bullshit if we don't have our original industry. Because would you like to come and visit a place that used to be a fishing community? Not really. Not that interesting for you as a visitor. Not that interesting for us as people to live. And so what we did was we started a little hand line fish business. In, in Newfoundland, when we say fish, we mean cod. If I mean to say salmon, I'll say salmon, but I won't. <laughs> and so we started a little hand line fish business and we take those fish and we bring them mostly to Toronto must be somebody in this room that wants to buy really beautiful cod. I'm just looking at someone, just look at them and whistle. Um, and we have developed a different market model. And so it, we take the money from the fish business and 70% of that money goes back. We can pay the fishers twice as much as they get for a gill net, netted fish. That's how you change. I mean, if I stood up on Fogo Island, Josh, don't say I said this. If I stood up on Fogo Island and said, kill nets are bad, well, I'd be drowned in the harbor before dawn. Like, like, just people, like, you can't tell people stuff like that. Because it's not easy to go out on the North Atlantic. And who wants to go out there and catch them one by one? But if we can create the business model, then we're going to get a different outcome. So the business model is, is different. It's a social business. So why was that important to create businesses? And, and how have people responded to that change? I mean, people will respond to the, the table that's been set. I mean, we, when people say, oh, you know, people are jealous or greedy people and nobody cares, it's because we've been cast into a zero-sum game. And I think that every fisher would like to be paid twice as much for the price of fish. So it's my job to figure out a business model that allows that to happen. And it used to be, I mean, Ian Brown did a fantastic series for the Globe and Mail, maybe eight years ago, and it was about lobster. And you know Ian Brown's the writer for the Globe and Mail, right? So Ian Brown says he loves to have lobster on his birthday. And so he will go to his favorite restaurant in Toronto and order up lobster. And I guess Ian made the mistake one day of saying to the restaurateur, but why is it so expensive? And the restaurateur says, well, 
don't you talk to me about expensive. I make no money selling lobster. The only reason I sell it is because people expect it, and I'm hoping that the person sitting next to you orders something that's not lobster. And then maybe I don't go broke. And so Ian thought that was a funny thing because he's, he listens to the lobstermen in Nova Scotia complaining that they can barely make a living. So he went to Nova Scotia, like, what's happening with the money? So he went to Nova Scotia. He said the hardest part was picking which lobster. He went out fishing, picked the lobster, called him Larry, wrote a series for the Globe called Larry the Lobster. And he followed Larry from Nova Scotia to Toronto. And Larry changed hands something like six or seven times. And every time Larry changed hands, the price doubled. Now you think about value. Like we have a broken relationship between the financial value of something and its economic value. And the people who are catching the lobster, adding a lot of value. The restaurateur, adding a lot of value. And Toronto style rents, weren't making any money at all. So you have to, we have to really think when we think about systems, we have to dis intermediate is that the right word or disaggregate there's a fancy word there i can't remember what the word is but you know we have to break it down so it's more direct so the value the financial value accrues to where the value is created so one of the things that Shorefast has done and is known for is this economic nutrition labeling. Um, what, it part, what it aims to do is to show people where the money goes. So I know you have a great one for the inn and this one's for the fish. Why the economic nutrition label and what impact is it having? What story is it helping tell? We have to, we have to make the economy more apparent to ourselves. And I think that people are discouraged by an economy they don't understand and don't know how to influence. And food systems, of course, is a really important part of that economy. And, and then we got all of this, you know, buy local posters and whatever. So Diane Hodgins, who is our CFO, she thinks probably more than is good for her mental health about uh, where the money goes. And so for everything we sell, we simply put this label that you see here and you can tell this is the same label that goes on food, right? The, the person who designed this beautiful image died a few weeks ago. He was an American graphic designer. So we thought, well, that's already in people's heads. Let's just use that. And for, so this happens to be for Fogo Island fish. So if someone buys this fish from us, 49% of it is the product cost itself. And then, of course, we have to get it here. And, you know, just if we have to finance it and all of that, and we aim for a small surplus, and of course, whatever surplus we have, because it's a 100% social business, goes back to the island. But the more interesting part is the bottom part. We tell you where the money goes geographically. Because we are, what we're doing is we're strip mining places, generally. Like, money leaves, but money rarely comes back. And so 69% of it goes back to Fogo Island. And I think that's the magic of how you build the national economy is you've got to get the money to flow out to the places that people live. And that's, you know, and, and innovation is local. Technology is global, but innovation is local. So all of the richness of our country, do you know we have 3,797 incorporated communities in this country? That's not counting the little unincorporated hamlets. And we have a 637 indigenous communities. This is like a tyranny of riches of culture and nature. And think of all the knowledge that lives in all those places. And of all those places, about 500 have access to banking services. 500 of 4,500. So what does that make the country? It makes it a bunch of stranded assets. So I think Canada is like just beginning. We're getting, we're going to get ourselves organized. Now, we're not going to convince chartered banks to, you know, build buildings in campus casing anymore, but we're clever enough people to figure out how we can bring financial capital to bear in places that are producing leaders and entrepreneurs and we're growing potatoes and catching fish and whatever else we're doing across the country. Well, there's also ice cream, another social business that's emerged on Fogo Island. You know, we, on Fogo Island, we have 26 kinds of edible berries. All, we have many more, but we, all the rest are collectively called poison berries because we never knew what they actually were. So everybody's mom said, no, those are poison berries. They're probably not. And so we, th we think about value. So, like, so now we have something that has like, deeply inherent intrinsic value. Like, you know, if you survive as a berry on the northeast coast of Newfoundland, you contain a lot of goodness. So we think about, okay, how can we ask the berries nicely to help us make a living here? And so how do we add value? So we started an ice cream shop and we have, you see them all 
presented in ice cream. And I think there are some of the berries we present that even local people say, well, I never really liked that berry. Well, let's have it in ice cream, let's see. But, you know, I have a friend, the same guy, the same guy with the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. He grew up in ex Czechoslovakia, right on the Russian border. And every time he comes to the island, he says, you know, there's something wrong with you people. He said, money grows on bushes here. You just don't see it. And so we have these berries called cracker berries, which we dismiss because eh, they're not that interesting. It turns out they have more nutrition than any other berry. He said, see, money grows on bushes. What's wrong with you people? So it's about thinking differently about development. Yeah. Yeah. So we have nine minutes and 36 seconds. I know, sentences. we're going to go right through. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're an excellent time. I feel very nervous by this clock. <laughs> it is. It does feel like pressure to yes. watch the clock. Um, historically, Newfoundland has had song circles, and one of the things that's been introduced in the last few years is this idea of a food circle. Tell us what they are and how they bring people together. Well, song circles are like three of us could get together, and in, in Newfoundland, and I don't know so much Labrador, but probably the same. You know, we got electricity in my in 1971 where I grew up. I was 13. So it wasn't like we weren't watching anything and we entertain each other. So you have this beautiful expression in Newfoundland, which would be, give us a song. Like it's a gift, give us a song. And everybody sings. And so if a song circle is, you just gather around and as the night goes on, the circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more people join. And so when we started this food, like focusing on food in our work and, oh my gosh, this was another whole thing that happened. Um, the New York Times hired, you know that, very depressing Norwegian writer, uh, Narosgaard, you know who I'm talking about? Oh, Josh, you know, so he, he, was, he was asked by the New York Times to come to, uh, to come to North America and follow the route of the Vikings. And so we're gonna to get to this, I promise. Anyway, but we're gonna go, so he um, apparently is not a very organized fellow. He tried to come to the US because apparently the Vikings were in Minnesota or something and they wouldn't let him in because his passport had expired. So he thought he'd try Canada because it was on his path because, you know, the Vikings came down the, the west coast of Newfoundland. And anyway, we let him in because he had a letter from the New York Times. And we thought, oh, we could let him in. And uh, anyway, so he comes and, he's, and he wants to go to uh, where the Vikings were on the west coast in the, in the park there, and, uh, which is an amazing place to visit. Except, of course, it was winter. It was closed. And he ended up at the top of the northern peninsula in a... You know, and this is the way the man writes. And he's in this, I, I don't know what the motel was. And he said, I looked around the room and everything was made of plastic, including the sheets were made of plastic. And he doesn't say it like that's a bad thing. He just says it. And then he went to the restaurant and he said, and everybody in the restaurant was fat. He didn't say it like it was a bad thing. He just said it like he saw it. Well, this caused such an uproar in Newfoundland. Like, oh my gosh, the open line programs were like, it was out of control. And who is this guy to tell us we're fat? Anyway, on about the fifth day, somebody called in and said, maybe we are. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it set off a big think in Newfoundland about what are we doing and what are we eating? And like I said, we fell into the industrial food hole and it's not been easy getting out. And so these food circles, mimic, which mimic song, song circles, we, we try to have them around topics like cod. If you want to get people to come out and have a talk about food, start with cod, because we have a million different things we do with it. And so this has become, so this Sophie, and she's a chef at the inn. That's Norm Foley, who can grow absolutely anything. And he, he's a, in the Irish community of tilting, they're particularly good with potatoes. They're the only people in the world who can grow anything in a fog bank. So there's something that we need to learn from these people about growing in different soils. Anyway, so this kind of way of, of talking about how do we get here in a way that's not, um, in a way that's social, first of all. And um, we, we got Narl's guard who he was the electric eel in the pond. Don't think he's been invited back to Newfoundland. <laughs> One of the other things that's um, emerged recently is a storehouse. What happens in a storehouse? So Shorefest has the inn. We have a furniture business, we have a fish business, and we have an ice cream shop. And we've not had a, a, a place that we can start to muck around with moving the traditional foods into the contemporary in a way that people are coming along with us. I mean, it's all very well and fine. I mean, local people, we're in our 10th year at the inn, and so we've invited every household on the island to come back and stay because they own the inn. And I think it's sometimes hard to make the leap from what I eat at home 
to what this you know, fancy food at the inn is. And so, because all the steps in between are missing. And so the storehouse gives us a chance to do this um, in a way that we get tangled up with each other and we can, this is, I think this was about pickling this particular night. And so it is, a, all the good journeys are slow journeys. This is a, a slow journey toward thinking about food differently. And you know, if you want someone to fall in love with a chickpea, you better give them a burger or they ain't coming in. <laughs> So when we started, it was like, okay, it's all really healthy dishes. Like, nobody wants to come. It's just too much, too soon, too fast, too far. So it's making the, you know, it's like we have to build a bridge. You know who Bruce Mao is? And Bruce Mao, remember he had that, he's a fantastic Canadian designer. And he had this massive change project. And my God, like, who wouldn't fall in love with Bruce Mao? He's from Sudbury. Oh, it must be hard to grow things in Sudbury. It's all rocks up there too. Anyway. Bruce Mao had this thing, massive change. And I remember reading the book and everyone went to the show and then nothing changed. And there's a film about Bruce, which you should, it's called Mao. It's really worth watching. And in the film, they say to him, how come, like you did all this beautiful work and he showed us a path, but nothing changed. And he said, well, maybe we didn't build a bridge for people to cross. And the storehouse is, a, is the bridge. The storehouse is an island, by the way. The most important island just is in that point of navigation, just outside the harbor. See, so, Dan, in the interest of time, with our three minutes and 48 seconds and counting, um, I want to move to the image of the cauliflower. I think when I first got to know you, you gave me a cauliflower pin. Oh, we should have I, I know I, yeah. we should have worn our yes. cauliflower pins. And there's a, cauliflower, there's a theory around the cauliflower. Can you tell us a bit about that? So I grew up on this island eating potatoes and turnips and cabbage and seal and fish and moose. And I went to Ottawa to go to university and I got a job at the local IGA, the grocery store. And I was like the worst cashier because I didn't know what any of the vegetables were because I'd never seen all of this. <laughs> anyway, I never remember this, this thing, this cauliflower thing, never seen anything like it. And uh, I was studying business. And when I got it explained to me, I realized, oh my goodness, this is a perfect fractal. It's like a pattern that repeats and repeats. And Fogo Island is one little floret. And Toronto is a much bigger floret. And so I think about the world, or just start with the country. We gotta clean up at home first before we go telling other people what to do. Anyway, think about the country. For, let's call it, for the sake of rounding, 4,500 florets that make up this country. And they're all held together by the stem. We live in the florets. And the STEM, these are the systems that we all talk about. And most of our careers are in the systems of different kinds. The STEM has two jobs to do. Number one job, hold us all together. And we're not doing a very good job of holding us all together at the moment. And number two job, bring nutrition to the florets. And that includes economic nutrition. Otherwise, there won't be florets where we live. It's like cauliflower thinking is really saying, put place at the center of everything, not as an afterthought. And there's a, a fantastic book by a fellow named Rajan, who our community economy's work was modeled after, or, I mean, not modeled after, but modeled around somehow. And uh, he's at the University of Chicago. He used to be head of the Reserve Bank of India. And he says this very simple thing. Human societies rest on three pillars, markets, governments, and communities. And he goes on to say, most of the problems that we see, whether they relate to climate, or mental health, or homelessness, really can be attributed to the diminution of communities. And that community pillar has been so badly eroded. Now we need to come up, everybody needs a therapist because our communities have fallen apart and can't take care of us. And there are too many of us to take care of one by one. And this idea that we got to get the community pillar to be not just a bunch of loose ends, so it can, and then we got to build that structure, like we talked about earlier, so that markets, communities, and governments can work together. I know people in public policy who write all kinds of really well-intentioned public policy that lands like a thud, because it's not context-rich. And we try to make things generic that can't be generic and shouldn't be generic. So that's, that's a cauliflower thinking. Mm -hmm. 
So we're on our last slide, and one of the questions I had for you is, you've moved from Fogo Island into the city and for business, and now back building community. What are some of the lessons you've learned personally in that community work over the last several years? And, and what could you share in terms of some of the takeaways others might, might use as they're building in their own communities? So I went home 15 years ago, and I don't think I real two things I would say. I don't think I realized at the beginning, I know I didn't, just how incoherent communities can be. It's like many people think that the community equals the municipality. It is not so. A community is the sum of all of us, all of the institutions are in a place. And you know that great expression, it's actually from an, an American not-for-profit, I wanna steal their tagline, but stealing's bad. I won't do that. But their tagline is, resources follow coherence. And most communities, especially the more trouble they're in, the, the more incoherent they are, because they, we haven't come together to coordinate. And we're not gonna to come together and agree on everything. Like, we, this is just nonsense. We're going, but we can come together and collaborate around our local economy. So the importance of building these structures, that's super important. And then the other thing is, everything is hitched up with everything else. It's all one. So no community is going to survive, let alone flourish, unless all of the systems, whatever systems they are, we could be talking about the health system, the transportation system, the banking system. If those systems, if you're not knitted into those systems, you will not exist. And so we have increasingly over the last 15 years, you know, kind of left the ground to orient by looking at what are the systems? Like we've done some really hard to do things. In 15 years, I cannot get the ferry schedule to line up with the plane that lands in Gander. Because, because we're subpar optimizing, right? So in, in transportation, air transportation, let's say, in the old days, uh, the government of Canada would say to Air Canada, you gotta fly to Capus Casing, you gotta fly to Estevan, you gotta fly here, you gotta fly there. I mean, the whole place, the, the airline just spoke, well, it did go bankrupt. Just this doesn't work. So then we didn't stop in the middle. We went to the other extreme and said, well, you can fly wherever you like. Well, I'm telling you, they don't get up in the morning and say, we're going to fight a gander. So somewhere in those two extremes is an answer, which is governments need to cooperate and collaborate with airlines to make their business models work to serve a broader range of communities, which will come back to us as, as, as people in this country. So that's the kind of, so I think this systems literacy and understanding how it's all hooked up with everything else, because you have to be holistic. This is the, maybe the, what you're, I'm trying to get to it. If I talk long enough, I'll get the answer. You have to be holistic in understanding everything that touches what you're doing. You have to be incremental because you can't do everything all at once. Because, but you have to be holistic because any one thing, any one of them can, can trip you up. And this systems literacy is so important for people no matter where they live, to understand what is going on and what is my role in what is going on. So our clock seems to have stopped or it's giving us oh, extra wait, wait, time. Wait, look, we got three more minutes. Wait, I don't know if we just got, I don't know if it's like overtime we're in now. I don't know what's time. happening, but I, I want to, <laughs> I just want to ask you a final question because I know we're near the end. Um, Zita, one of the things in speaking with you that the, the audience here can probably feel today is that there's a contagion to what you say, right? There's an excitement and an enthusiasm in your words and your examples that you've said and the work that's being done. Is there a message that you would want to leave people here today with? Big question. Yeah, I, I think it's to think deeply about value. Like we, I mean, the world is crying out for more systems of value. We have crushed most systems of value except the economic system of value. And like, we're just humans, we're not angels. And everything that we need to be well and to do well exists in a place. And yet, none of our systems put place first. And if every study and all of this around, you know, what do, what do we need to be happy? I don't know what that is. And I'm not, I'm not recommending that that should be your goal in life, to be happy. I think you should take what my father says. Try to be useful. Because if you're useful, you'll have a good life. You know, we all need some sense of autonomy. 
We all need to feel connected to other people and not through the front door of, what do they call it now? X and out the other, it's not a connection. We all need to feel some sense of competence and to be respected by others for that. And the fourth one, which is getting added lately because I didn't realize it was a question, but I guess it really is a question. We need to have a sense of the future. All of those things can only be accomplished in a place. I have an eight-year-old nephew. Well, he's not eight anymore, but when he was eight, every time he heard me talk about my work, he would say, is it a community or is it a community? <laughs> I said, well, that's the point. A good community is often a community <laughs> because you're figuring out how to muck along. And I think that's where meaning comes from. And the minute we can all say, well, you know, I don't, you are inconvenient to me because you don't agree with me and I'm just going to go and hang out with my friends who live in the world of bits. Even Peter Thiel, I hate quoting Peter Thiel because like, you know who he is, right? Yeah. Anyway, we're going to talk about Peter Thiel for a minute. He said, it's actually quite easy to do things in the world of bits. He said, but it's the world of atoms where things are really hard. And we live, we are like made up of an atomic bits and pieces. That's where it's hard. But that's where the richness is. Like, go toward where it's hard. That's on the ground. That's great. Sita, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you.